Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Um, I am not exactly sure where my background image is on this, but that's all right. We're about to take a two week break. Uh, at the end of the month, of course. I hope you had a really good Thanksgiving as well if you're here in uh, the U.S. Um, we weren't obviously doing an episode last week because we were all hanging out. But uh, we have three episodes left, including today uh, for 2023. And then we're off for two weeks for the holidays, for Christmas and New Year's. And then we will be back um, in the first portion of January. And we'll be kicking it off once again. Uh, so three episodes left, but today is the final uh, Night Skies episode for 2023. Uh, the year has come to an end, and we're also going to be showing the final totem target um, for this month. Uh, for those of you who haven't received your patches, uh, this month's been kind of crazy with the holidays uh, starting up. Uh, so we do have the list together for everyone who shot last month's target. That'll be probably going out next week at some point and then we'll get uh november's uh patches ready to go so october hasn't shipped yet i'm sorry uh it's just been very hectic and then we will get november's out as well so some of you might be getting a couple patches uh or and so yeah uh, but the totem patches are getting ready to go out the door and then we'll get to the final target for the year as well so it should be kind of fun uh, if you like what you see here on the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on the video. Let us know what we're doing a good job, and we will, you know, do what we can. So I don't like this whole screen thing that's going on. I'll have to figure out why my background image is not working because it's kind of driving me nuts. I wonder if I can make it work right here. Nope. How about here? Nope. Here? Here? Anyways, I don't know what's going on with it, but it's kind of driving me nuts. So don't worry about it. We'll fix it in the two weeks that we have off coming up, and we'll, we'll hammer some stuff out. All right. If you like what you see on the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and leave a like on the channel. Uh, hit subscribe. We're almost at 10,000 subscribers, so help us get to that mark. Um, if you want to see what's going on at Skywatcher, please go over to skywatcherusa.com and up at the top, go up to uh, where you're going to see subscribe and save and go ahead and click that button up there. And that's how you can jump on our email list. It lets you know about all the sales that are going on. It lets you know what the totem target's going to be and what we're doing for the month. Uh, but yeah, we're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but head on over there. Um, we have a ton of stuff on sale on right now as well. Um, nearly all of the mounts with, are on sale with a handful of maybe a couple little ones that aren't available. But literally, just about all of our mounts are on sale right now. Um, we finally have tons of inventory available. Uh, sprees are on sale right now. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for something for the holidays, um, hop over there and grab it wouldn't wait too long if you want some cool like holiday ideas just really quick there's the star travel az gte that's a cool little go-to telescope and a pretty nice four inch refractor um what else do i got in here we have the heritage scopes for 235 bucks for the five inch um those are in stock uh i don't know do we have 150s we do have 150s if you want a six inch there's a six inch and then the virtuoso gti's um, the 150s go very quickly, but you can check with some of the dealers. Um, but we do have here at Skywatcher, we have some of the 130s in stock. Um, if you're looking for a go-to scope for 375. So, uh, that's, uh, all the stuff is nearly on sale at this point. And then if you want something cool to go with it, you can go over to skywatcher.threadless.com and pick up some neat swag, uh, to go along with it, or just to go along with your Skywatcher stuff in general. And that's skywatcher.threadless.com. Go over and check that out. It also supports the channel and lets us know we're doing a good job. All right, so let's get started with what's up for the month. 
Um, we had a ton of totem entries too, so we got to get to that. So first up, of course, is the moon. Uh, new moon for December is December 13th. Um, so nice and dark. We're only a couple weeks away from that. Um, the dark sky weekend, of course, is going to be the 9th and the 10th. So that's next weekend. Uh, but dress warmly because it's probably going to be cold um, wherever you're going to be. Uh, and then our full moon is just after Christmas, which means if you're getting a telescope for Christmas or any of the special holidays that are going on this time of year towards the end of December, if you're getting a telescope for a holiday gift, you'll have a really nice nearly full moon to go out and observe on the night that you get it. Um, especially if you're getting one for Christmas, you have a nice, if you have a nice clear night, you're going to have the moon, you're going to have Saturn, you're going to have Jupiter, you have all kinds of cool stuff to uh, observe on your first night out with your telescope. Now, like I said, it is cold, and that's why the full moon for December is known as the cold moon, because of the frigid conditions that uh, take place this time of year. Um, so please dress warmly if you're going to go out and observe or do some imaging, especially to our friends up north and the Canadians up north. It gets crazy cold. I don't know how you guys even put up with it, quite honestly. I'm a desert dweller, though. So if you came here, you'd probably melt um, in the summer. But it's crazy cold out there. But um, when some of you write in saying, I was imaging last night, it was negative whatever. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's a large cup of no. So, uh, but yeah. So the full moon is December 27th. That means you've got a really nice uh, set of objects to go out and observe on right around the holidays as long as you don't get the new scope curse which means it's just going to be cloudy so all right planets now we have quite a display of planets up right now we're going to jump over to stellarium to talk about the planets though stellarium is a free app that's available online um i think it's an app that you can actually get on various devices as well um, but it's a great freeware planetarium and you can actually do some telescope controls with it, though I don't know much about it because I don't use it. I'm just starting to get a hold of Nina, um, which we're actually probably going to be doing an episode on, on how to connect Nina to your Skywatcher hardware, um, next year. Um, I think in January it's on the list of things to get to, uh, but we're doing a Nina episode, um, after I've kind of finalize finishing how to get it all to work i've got it all talking now i just need to make sure it works correctly uh, but let's talk planets right now so right now let's see in the east we have the planet jupiter um you probably see that right as the sun goes down um in the east you'll see jupiter naked eye visible it's an easy planet to get a hold of and then not far from jupiter which it is technically a naked eye planet but we also have the planet Uranus, but you need to be in a dark sky site. Um, we were doing an event last month, early November, right? I don't remember when the star party was now that I think about it. It was fun, though. But it was a dark sky site, and the planet Uranus was naked eye, just barely out there. It's shining at just around 6 magnitude, um, I think is what it's at yeah 5.67 so it's a naked eye object if you're in a slightly darker sky than here in the city but it's about halfway between jupiter and the pleiades right now if you're looking for visible naked eye orientation on where to find the planet uranus or just use your go-to telescope and cheat um but uranus is a really cool planet i like showing that at events because it's not typically a naked eye planet but it still looks like a little ball and it's way out there so people think it's actually cool and then you get all the Uranus jokes, and that's why you need to make a Uranus jar. So every time you get a Uranus joke at an event, you got to put a dollar in it. And that right there is how you buy an Esprit 150. All the Uranus jokes you'll ever hear. You'd be amazed how fast it actually accumulates. Um, yes, it is. Go-to is cheating. No, it's, it's not cheating. It's a convenience. But I'm a Dob guy, so learn the night sky. Um... But anyway, so yeah, yeah bleh, had a seizure. Um, Uranus is up, not far from the Pleiades. Jupiter, naked eye visible, um, easy right now. Uh, we do have Neptune up right now. Neptune's a fairly difficult planet uh, to observe. It's a dark blue and it's rather small. Um, but 
it's up there. It's a cool one to show, especially if you're doing outreach events, but it is a little bit of a challenge because of how far out there it is. It's hard to render it as a sphere or a ball. Um, like the planet Uranus is easy to distinguish that it's not stellar compared to the stars around it. Neptune is a little harder to do that. So, uh, but Neptune is up there right now. And then of course we have Saturn. Saturn is a gem right now, nice and high. Um, it is starting to set. Um, it's past the, uh, oh man, I can't remember half of these things, but uh, the meridian. It's past its meridian right now um, after dark. So it's it's just transits the meridian um, right around sunset. And then as it progresses, it, it sets. So um, by the end of the month, let's see if there's any cool conjunctions with them. Yeah. So let's see. December 17th, um, you'll have a close approach with Saturn and a nice little crescent moon right there. That'll be one conjunction. Um, it's not terribly close, but it'll be kind of neat. Um, then you'll get another one with Jupiter and the moon around the 21st and the 22nd. Um, actually, Uranus and the moon, well, it's not that close. Um, so you'll have some close calls with Jupiter, and then that's pretty much it for the moon right now. So, um, But towards the end of the month, uh, Saturn's going to be making its way into the further southwestern sky at this point. Um, and yeah, by like nine o'clock, by the end of the month, around nine o'clock, Saturn's going to be going away. So we're still in prime Saturn season, but it is starting to wane a little bit, uh, where Jupiter's going to be sitting nice and high and all that fun stuff there. So uh, December is going to be our last kind of big hurrah for Saturn for the season. You'll probably get a little bit of it in January in the early evening, but as January moves on, we'll probably say goodbye to Saturn and, but we'll still maintain with Jupiter, um, up there as for naked eye planets at least. And then you can catch Venus in the early morning hours. All right. The sun, uh, the sun, actually the sun was quite busy this week. Um, if you haven't seen it, there is a lot of possibility over the next couple days as well as last night that there's going to be some Aurora in the Northern part, North and Southern poles. Um, because we had a nearly X class flare fire off on, I want to say it was probably Tuesday. I think it was an M class 9.8, which was nearly X class. A uh, big, big flare. Um, but I had some friends get a hold of it. Our friend Simon, who you've probably seen on here before, got some cool stuff. But there's a lot of cool things going on today. Look at all that stuff. Big prominence there. Nice little filament stretched all across the sun. So if you have like a double stack hydrogen alpha solar telescope, get out there and take a look at it. You see all this cool detail. Um, if you just have a regular hydrogen alpha telescope, nothing wrong with that either. There's some nice prominences out there. So go check that out as well. Uh, but this region down here is where that big flare fired off from the other day. I believe it was this section down here. Um, but the sun's got a lot going on and remember we are ratcheting up at least here in North America for the April 8th total solar eclipse. So I would make sure that you've got all your solar needs done as soon as possible. Uh, the eclipse that we had in October, that was very nice. Uh, but the total solar eclipse is the big one. Uh, whether it's eclipse glasses or just regular filters, make sure you have it all together as soon as possible. Do not wait because the closer we get to April, it's just going to get stupid. Um, it always happens because you have everyone who waited till the last minute and it's like, oh, I should have gotten that. So you know when it is. It's just like the holidays. You know what it is. Don't be that person that goes in on Christmas Eve being like, I just need to find this toy. Sorry. So uh, let's see what's going on. So that's the sun. Some cool stuff going on there. Uh, so definitely get out and check it out. Make sure you are using the proper solar filters. If you don't know anything about solar filters, we did a bunch of episodes a couple years ago um, that will talk all about solar filters and go back and watch that as well. 
Meteor showers. Uh, we do have a good one this month, actually. This is the Geminid meteor showers, and guess what? It lands on the new moon weekend, too. Uh, Geminids are pretty fast, and they're bright. So if you're going to be out in a dark sky site uh, next weekend, you'll probably catch the uh, early portions of the Geminids uh, because it's a very thin little moon uh, that will not hinder your views of the meteor showers uh, that are going to be going on there. So Got, got a good meteor shower this time, um, and it's timed well. So get out there and check it out if you're going to some dark skies. Uh, keep your eye out for the constellation of Gemini as it rises in the east. Uh, the, Gemids, uh, the Geminids do pretty well before midnight, um, where most meteor showers are after midnight is best. But what I was reading was the Geminids do a little bit better before midnight, and they obviously carry on throughout. So... But the peak is the 13th and the 14th, so that'll be kind of cool if you're interested in watching meteor showers. Comets. Uh, there's some decent comets up right now. Um, let me flip back over here. If you want to know more about comets, go to cometchasing.skyhound.com. Uh, that is my favorite website to use. Um, the big one that everyone's talking about is Comet 12P Ponds Brooks. Um, this comet is slated to be naked eye visible during the eclipse in April. So that could be really interesting. Um, so this is the one that we want to keep an eye on right now. Um, it's getting a fair amount of attention for a comet that really isn't naked eye visible. It's sitting about magnitude 9 right now. Um, we did get to see it at the star party this past month that I was out. I used my 28 inch to see that and Comet H2 Lemon, which is pretty much out of the sky for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Our Southern Hemisphere friends are going to be taking a look at that. That one was pretty easy to see. Uh, 12P Ponds Brooks. Uh, that one is uh, pretty good. Uh, there's an animation here. Let's see. There was some. I don't want to watch all this. Never mind. Go there and look it up yourself. So, and I made the whole thing disappear. So, comet chasing that sky out. Boop. There we go. Um, yeah, you can go there and watch a video. I'm not going to make you guys watch a video. So, but that's a pretty cool one to actually go out and take a look at. 12P Ponds Brooks. If you've got a camera, hook it up. Do a cool time lapse of it going through the star field. You can do that from home in your backyard. Um, let's see where. Oh, I got to go down here. 12P Ponds Brooks. Find your chart. Boop. There we go. So you can see right here it's 121. It's actually heading pretty close to Vega right now. Um actually tonight might be kind of cool. If you want to get the comet near the red star T Lyra, which is a carbon star we've talked about last month, you might have a pretty cool opportunity to get uh, the comet over the next couple nights panning through the field of T Lyra. So that would be uh, kind of neat. And if you're looking for kind of a photo opportunity and looks like February 26th, it's going to be going through an open cluster right around here. Um, so there's some little flybys that this comet's going to be doing as it's making, uh, as it makes its way through Lyra and it into Cygnus. So keep an eye on that one right now. If you're looking for something, uh, what is this comet 62 P? Interesting. So Comet 62P, this guy right here. Um, Joseph in the comments is saying that's going to go right by the Leo triplet, um, which could be kind of cool on December 28th. Let me find that chart. Here it is. Boop. Oh, yeah, look at that. Right down in here. Right about there. So you might have a cool photo op with this Comet brushing through leo in the early morning hours so keep an eye on that one that's 62p uh i'm gonna butcher this to shannon i'm sorry so um but yeah that's at 11.7 magnitude right now so it's 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 a telescope uh target all these are actually telescopes 9.8 9.4 8.6 all these are telescopic um but yeah, give it a go. There's some decent comets that are up right now. So definitely head over there and take a look at all of that. So some fun comets are visible right now. But you go over to cometchasing.skyhound.com and check it out. 
We're flying through today's episode. So. Deep sky targets. Now, I could do a whole hour on crazy deep sky targets that are up this time of year. So we'll just kind of run down some of it. Um, right now, M45, the Pleiades cluster, it's in Taurus. This is an easy one to view. It's a great target if you're getting like a set of binoculars or a small telescope for the holidays. It's an awesome target to go out and actually take a look at. Um, it's very easy seeing it rise up in the east um, right now. And it's, it's actually sitting pretty high by the early evening. Um, but it's a great target to actually observe. And it's a great outreach target as well. Um, imaging. Uh, the Pleiades is a very elaborate target because there's the star cluster and then there's all the dust that hangs out in there. Um, so there's all this reflection nebula and dust that sits in this region. The star cluster is actually passing through the dust. Um, it's not actually part of the cluster itself. So the cluster is passing through this like celestial cirrus, uh, that's up there right now. So there's some really cool stuff there um the pleiades looks great in like any focal length too if you're imaging it if you're zoomed in you get all these delicate you know silky little tendrils that the nebulosity within the cluster uh, looks pretty good but then that extends way out um beyond the pleiades cluster there's all kinds of intricate dust up there so uh, there's some really cool images there and then if you're in a dark enough sky Visually, you can actually start picking up some of the Pleiades as well. Uh, what F ratio should get all the Pleiades in the image? It's not really about the F ratio. Um, the F ratio is just your physical aperture. Um, what you want is the focal length. Now, the Pleiades works pretty good in nearly any focal length. Um, if you want to get the entire Pleiades cluster for the most part, um, you're looking at about a thousand millimeters at a full frame. Um, let me pull up some of my images here. Do to do, bear with me. We've got time to kill anyway. Imaging. I've got way too many. Here we go. So this is the Pleiades cluster at a thousand millimeters with a full frame camera. Um, and as you can see it, it frames it pretty well actually but you can see a lot of how delicate that is this was shot at f7 not that that really particularly matters um so that's 1000 millimeter 1050 millimeters if we're being accurate um full frame you can see it it fits it in there quite well um now the other this image right here was also taken at full frame but this is at 550 millimeter with an esprit 100 uh so the Pleiades looks great in almost any focal length. As people are saying in the chat, 670 works well. 300 to 400 works well. Um, it really just depends how much extension of the dust that you want to get. Um, and it goes quite far. So um, I would say anywhere between 200 millimeters to 1,000 millimeters is ideal. It just depends how you want to frame the target. So, um, but if you're doing telescope and you kind of want to frame it, I'd probably like everyone else is saying 400 to 800, and all that's going to be dictated about how big the sensor is. Whether it's a, you know, full frame crop, that's going to dictate your field of view as well. Um, F ratio is just means you can do more in less time. So, that's the Pleiades. Uh, it's a great target to actually mess with, but it can be very challenging because of all this intricate dust that's in the region. So, uh, M15, this is a great uh, globular cluster, and there's not a lot of globular clusters up in the fall and winter time. Um, so, M15 is kind of unique. Uh, this is up in Pegasus, about 35,000 light years away. Uh, it's an easy target to actually do from in town, but it's more impressive in darker skies, obviously. Uh, imaging wise, M15 and most globulars are pretty easy because it's a very dense ball of light and they're, they're not really affected by like gradients that you get in an image. It's easy to, easier to clean up gradients in an image um, in the middle of town when you're shooting a globular because there's not a lot of faint detail that would be affected by a gradient. Um, and they can add some really cool star cluster or star color into them. There's a lot of blues that sit inside of uh, globular clusters like this. But one 
uh, thing that's really interesting to me about M15 is you have this uh, nebulosity, very faint nebulosity that is in that field there. And that's pretty cool to actually see what these new cameras is. They're so sensitive that you're in, allowed to get this integrated flux nebula that's actually floating around a lot of these objects. And there's a lot of hydrogen floating around. So if you're shooting these areas, don't be afraid to put some hydrogen alpha in there and see what comes out. Uh, next one, M31. This is a great galaxy. Um, it's one of the easiest galaxies to get right now. It sits nice and high after sunset. Um, this is very similar to the Pleiades. It looks great in a wide range of focal lengths. Um, visually, from in town, it's not super impressive. You don't get the extension of the arms and a lot of the dust uh, lanes because the light pollution generally knocks it out. But you can still see the core and you can see that's companion galaxies, M32s right here, and M110 over here. Uh, it's a fun visual target just to know that you're looking at something that's two and a half million light years away. And of course, that's in the constellation of Andromeda. If the name did not give that away. Um, imaging wise, it's easily doable from in town. You don't need anything fancy, maybe a light pollution filter like an L Pro. Um, you can throw some cool hydrogen alpha detail in here. Um, our friend Trevor at Astro Backyard is doing a lot of imaging of targets within galaxies. He just did a video. I was on talking a little bit about it. Um, we can go over there and check out, uh, Trevor was talking about M33, but um, there's a lot of stuff in Andromeda you can go for, like these H2 star forming regions. So Andromeda is a fun one to go after right now. Visually, it's a cool challenge target, especially if you're getting your first telescope for the holidays. You want to see a galaxy. Boop. There you go. Um, or, you know, you can just check it out. Uh, if you're looking for a really challenging imaging target, there's the Sharpless 155, the Cave Nebula. This is up in Cepheus. Cepheus is my favorite imaging constellation because everything up there is just dark and dusty. Um, which are my favorite nebulas. Uh, Cepheus is basically a dust bowl. Uh, there's all kinds of nebulas in there. A lot of molecular clouds, which are very dark, cold um, clouds of dust. Um, really elaborate stuff that's in there. Um, Sharpless, the cave nebula right here is a big hydrogen region. So you could easily shoot this in town with an H-alpha filter. Uh, visually, it's... I've never seen it visually without the aid of a very big telescope with night vision and an H alpha filter. So visually it's not a great visual target. Um, but from with light pollution, uh, just put an H alpha filter. It's very easy to, you can do some really cool stuff with these narrow band filters that are out there. Um, so check that out. There's another shot of the cave nebula. Uh, one of my favorites that are up right now is IC59 and 63. It's the Ghost of Cassiopeia, also known as the Gamma Cass Nebula. Uh, this is right off the central star of Cassiopeia, so it's very easy to find. Um, but I love objects that have that contrast of a very bright star next to a very faint, delicate nebula or object. Um, it's pretty close. It's about 600 light years away from the Earth. Um, you can, excuse me, you can do this visually. From dark skies, I find that no filter helps, but if you are going to use a filter, I'd probably say a UHC because um, there is a mix of hydrogen and oxygen-3 in this nebula, so a UHC might help. Um, I'd probably say about a 14-inch telescope uh, would do it. I have saw I used a C14 that I had a few years ago, and that did a really nice job on it. I don't know if it was just a mix of aperture and focal length that did a nice job. I've seen it in my 28, but I think the C14 did better. Um, I don't know if it was a baffling thing or if just the conditions were better, but um, probably about a 10 or 12 inch telescope to really get this. And the trick that I could say for visual observers is this is kind of difficult to see. So once you get on target, you either want to use your hand controller, make sure it's set slowly, or if it's a daub, that's even better and just slowly move the telescope side to side and watch what moves with the star field. Um, Cause sometimes it looks like a reflection or a floater a little bit. So with something like this, you're gonna wanna be, just take your time and just watch. 
Um, and if you need to figure out what's in the field and what moves with it, just move the telescope either with your hand controller very slowly or move your Dobsonian if you're using that by hand and see what moves with it. But it's a very cool target. It's not as hard as people think it is, but you do need dark skies and some half decent aperture uh, to do it visually. Imaging wise, uh, one shot color is fine. It does do well with narrow band particularly it does better with um bicolor images so like h alpha and o3 there's not a lot of sulfur in this nebula another reason that i think sulfur filters are an absolute waste of money is there's just not a lot of sulfur visible in some of these objects there are those nebulas that that's not the case but if you're looking to spend some money on an imaging setup I personally would say forget the sulfur filter because you're probably going to pay five or something hundred dollars. You're going to pay a few hundred dollars for it. Go out and invest more money in a narrow band O3 and get a nice H alpha filter. So like a five nanometer H alpha and a three nanometer O3 and then just skip the sulfur would be my recommendation. Put your money in the O3. You'll get more use out of it. Um, but this is all hydrogen alpha that you're seeing there, just a straight HA shot. So, But that's a cool one to see, um, and it's not terribly difficult. In-town gradients might mess with you a little bit because there's it does extend out further, um, and there's a lot of very faint detail that gradients can cause a problem with uh, when you're shooting in-town. But if you're good at processing and you want to deal with it, but from a dark sky site, this is an easy target to, to hit. Uh, another one back into Cepheus, this is the Iris Nebula. The Iris is probably one of the easiest molecular cloud objects that you can see or you, that you can get. Um, visually, the Iris Nebula is nothing to write home about. You can see kind of that glowing area in the middle of the Iris. This is what shows up in a, in a telescope visually. And then you'll notice that a lot of the stars around this area are darkened. So you, you do notice that there is some cloud in the region, but it looks nothing like the shot. Um, but you just know that a lot of the stars tend to be muted in certain areas. So you can tell that there is some molecular cloud or dark cloud in the region, but it's not detailed at all. Um, the cameras are the only way you're going to be able to pick up a lot of that very faint uh, nebulosity uh, that's floating around in there. But visually, you only get the, the bright object in the center. Now, this is a reflection nebula in the middle there. There is no filter that will help you. So if you're going to shoot it, the only thing you really got to use is like an average light pollution filter or go to dark sky sites. This isn't something that's beneficial to narrow band filters. It, it won't do you any good. But that's the Iris Nebula, NGC 7023. That's a cool one. Another dark and dirty nebula that's up in this region is the Ghost uh, VDB 141. Um, this is pretty close to the Iris. But if you had a wide enough field of view, you would see how all this dust in Cepheus is kind of related to a handful of these molecular cloud reflection nebula objects that are all within the same region. Um, so a lot of these objects in Cepheus are part of a major dust cloud throughout the constellation. And we've just assigned or named the, the brighter regions that are within it. So the iris is one, um, the ghost is one, and there's a bunch of other stuff that's floating around in there. But if you are looking for some off the beaten path stuff, just point the telescope into Cepheus and see what you can get with it. A lot of the things with this stuff is it's very faint so lots of exposure time and if you're shooting monochrome a good luminance channel will help pop all that out because there's not a ton of color in this region you can see there's a lot of browns and kind of grays there's very little color in here so there's not a lot that you can saturate um, in here so um, really deep luminance is what you want to do when you're shooting molecular clouds um, or a lot of exposure time. That's where something like a Rasa or a Hyperstar or something fast will help kind of plow through some of the time needed to do that. But the Ghost is one of my favorite. There's a lot of detail in there. 
Uh, the Pinwheel M33. Uh, this one visually is a little harder than you would think it would need to be, being a Messier object, but it's very diffuse. The outer arms are very diffuse. It's a little further than Andromeda, 2.7 million light years, but not far from the galaxy. Um, you don't need to be in crazy dark skies to catch this thing, but you do need to be in a half decent sky to where you can detect it. And then, of course, if you want a good view of it, you need to be in some dark sky sites. It's not a in-town friendly galaxy um, because of how diffuse the arms are. You might detect a little bit of the core, maybe even some of the bright regions. I think it's NGC 604 um, is the bright um, region. I'll just switch here. Right here, this bright H2 knot that's in one of the arms there. Uh, that's a nebula within itself, NGC 604 or 602 I think it's 604 um, that's in there now this is something I want to mention right here and this if you go back and watch Trevor from Astro Backyards video he talks about this in detail in his latest video if you want to watch that but um, is there's a lot of cool detail within some of these galaxies where you can check out nebulas in other galaxies so M31 Andromeda has some of that. So if you're shooting it at a little H alpha detail, M33 has a lot of it. Actually, you can see right here from just a single sub or a stack of subs here that there's a lot going on in hydrogen in M33. Uh, uh, M51, the Whirlpool has a lot of this as well. So don't be afraid to add some narrow band time to some of these galaxies and then kind of you know, throw it in there to pop out some of these details. So visually, M33 is a bit of a challenge unless you're in darker skies. Imaging-wise, it's a bit easier, but the problem with M33 is some of those arms are very diffuse. You can see how it just kind of becomes very nebulous as it moves away from the core, and lots of little fine detail in there. So um, darker skies could help with this because there's a lot of stuff that gradients might actually, you know, hinder um, with this galaxy. But give it a go. Um, and then, of course, if you have the capability, add some H alpha into it. And you can see a lot of these little knots and stuff that are floating out in there. Um, but there's some cool stuff in there. Uh, the Bubble. Um, the Bubble Nebula is one of my favorite nebulas in the sky. Um, NGC 7635. This is in Cassiopeia. Um, distance is somewhere between 7,000 and 11,000 light years away. Um Visually, you need a half decent size telescope to get something like this. I'd probably say 14 inch, 12 to 14 inch or bigger, um, 20 inch or larger uh, is even better. Um, I I can see it in the 28 inch I have. I've seen it in a 25, and I wouldn't be surprised if you could see it in a 20 and an 18. Um, a UHC filter would probably be your most helpful. Um, you can see just a little bit of the brighter half of the this upper upper right quadrant of the bubble is normally what's most brightest. Um, that bright star is right there as well, and you can kind of see this little horn uh, portion that tends to come out in some of the larger telescopes that are when you're observing it. Um, there's not a lot you can see with the outer nebulosity unless you're using a very big telescope with night vision in H alpha. Huge difference. Um, it looks very similar to what you see here visually, which is pretty cool. But we're talking 20 inch plus uh, telescope at that point. Uh, but darker skies is ideal if you're trying to see this visually, especially if you don't have access to night vision. Um, you need to be in dark skies to visually do something like this. Uh, imaging wise, the bubble is really easy to do with narrow band filters. Um, it's very forgiving with H alpha O3 and even sulfur. You can do Hubble palettes with this one if you really need to. Um, you don't have to do anything fancy. This is a one shot color, uh, with a luminance channel laid onto it. I'll pop the detail out, but it works pretty well. And this is, this is shot on the Esprit 150 with a ZW6200, and uh, it's cropped in quite a bit on the bubble, but it handled it pretty well. Um, I've been trying some new processing techniques with some tools that I got, um, 
and from Russ Croman on his website, there's some really good noise uh, filters and stuff that he sells. And I think some of them are on sale right now, but check those out. Or maybe we'll do an episode about processing dark and dusty nebulas. Let me know in the chat if that's something that you guys might be interested in doing next year. And we can kind of go over how to process these really faint fuzzballs out there. Um, but the bubble's really cool. It's a challenge visually. You need a, a decent sized telescope. Imaging wise, um, there's a lot going on in the field of the bubble. Let me see if I can pull the whole bubble shot here. So here's the entire frame of the bubble. Um, you can see there's an awful lot. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Boop. There's an awful lot that's going in, around that field. Um, tons of nebulosity, tons of stars. Um, this is the full frame of the Esprit 150. Um, I think it's NG, or I'm sorry, Messier 52, this open cluster up here. There's some really cool dark nebulas, the lobster claw nebulas down here. And there's just a ton of other stuff floating around, but you can see the bubble is all hanging there, but we did a pretty heavy crop on that. Um, and there's some dark nebulas and there's a lot going on in this field. It's a pretty cool field to actually shoot, but um, the bubble is a lot smaller than people make it out um, to be. So adding some focal length is not a bad thing when we're talking about the bubble. Of course, what would it be if we didn't talk about these two? Uh, so M42 um, and the horse head. Uh, so they have the Orion Nebula and the horse head Nebula. Um, there's a lot going on in this region. Um, and I wanted to talk about this mainly because I shot this picture this last week or so from the backyard. I was pretty happy with it. Um, and I don't do a lot of imaging from home. Um, but I'm doing a lot of testing on things I can't tell you uh, yet. But I was also trying the Antlia tri-band filter, which I've had for a while, but I haven't really given it a good rundown. Um, so this was shot from the backyard, no moon. I think it's a 450 millimeter focal length or something like that. Just a basic Evo Star 80, nothing fancy. Um, but this is the complex of Orion right here. It's a, the whole constellation has just a ton of hydrogen clouds going through it. Um, I was actually surprised to see how much came out in this shot. But about 1,500 light years away for these two nebulas. Um, and I'm going to break it apart here because there's a lot going on in here. So I'll kind of elaborate. So let's go to the full frame. Uh, that Let me actually give you guys the full frame. Boop. There we go. Um, and I'll disappear into the background. Uh, so up at the upper right-hand corner, you have M42 and M43. I don't know why I'm telling you any of this because I have it all labeled. So starting at the bottom left, let's talk about this. Uh, bottom left, you have NGC 2024, the Flame Nebula. Now, if you're actually trying to observe uh, the Horsehead Nebula, um, this is the easiest part of this region that you're going to see when you start looking at the Horsehead. The bright star that you see over here, this is Almatak, um, which is one of the belt stars of the constellation. So NGC 2024 is very easy to see. You don't need any filters to catch it. Um, and a dark sky, it, you could probably see it in an 8 or 10 inch telescope. Now, just to the right of that, you have a smaller one, NGC 2023. This one, dark skies, because it's it's a reflection nebula, There's and there's a lot of dark detail around there. Um, so that's something that you want to take a look at. And then, of course, we have the big one, the Horsehead Nebula. Now, this is another shot. This is the full frame um, Esprit 150 again. Uh, this is a RGB image with hydrogen laced into it because I really like what I call the paint brush strokes. These little delicate wisps that sit above IC434. Um, hydrogen is the best way to bring those out. So I call them the brush strokes because they look like a paintbrush. Um, but if you want to get that detail, hydrogen alpha is the way to get that. Um, so that's the horse head in the flame, uh, more of a zoomed in shot. And then NGC 2023 is this portion right here. Um, and then Almatak is this star right here. So very easy object to find. 
but visually the horse head is very difficult to do. I would say at least a 10 inch telescope, very dark skies, wait for it to be as high as possible. And an H beta filter is the trick. Um, and even then it looks like you're looking for a, a black thumbprint on black paper. It, you have to be able to move the telescope side to side to see what's there. Um, I've seen this in a 20 inch daub without the aid of a filter. It's still a bit of a challenge. The H beta really kind of helps, but it's still faint. And even in my 28 inch um, with an H beta, it's there. It's noticeable. It's a lot bigger than people expect it to be. The horse head's actually a pretty decent sized structure. And what I mean by the horse head is this portion, just the head that's known as Barnard 33. The rest of the nebulosity in here is known as IC434. That's the hydrogen region. And then the horse head itself is B33. Um, and that's this region right here is what we're talking about. Um, that's pretty challenging to see. Decent telescope uh, in aperture, probably, like I said, 10 or 12 inch or bigger. The more aperture you got, the better. And the H beta filter is the trick. Um, then you have all this additional nebulosity that sits between the two major nebulas in the region. Um, lots of hydrogen. There is some O3 in there, um, but there's lots of hydrogen. Um, it's very hard to balance all this. Um, and then, of course, at the upper right, we have NGC 1975, um, the Running Man Nebula. And then, of course, you have the famous uh, Orion Nebula M42 and M43. Um, both of these nebulas are amazing to shoot in their own right, but I love getting them in one frame because I love the connecting nebulosity, um, to do this. And it goes even further. Um, I know Tolga here in the chat is asking about the Barnard loop, which I have shot from the backyard. Let me figure out where that is. Um, if you don't know what the Barnard loop is, the Barnard loop is a massive hydrogen loop that is in the constellation of Orion. And it's, I swear it's in here somewhere because I did a big mosaic. Here it is. Thinking about it. I don't remember how big this image is. There we go. Um, so this was shot from my backyard. I don't live in a dark sky. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it's crazy light polluted here. It's nothing great. Um, this is a multi-panel mosaic that was taken with a Starlight Express 16200 um, monochrome camera, a Canon 200mm f2.8 L prime, and an H alpha filter. So um, this is pretty much the Barnard loop right there. Um, you can see where we shot, or I shot this other nebula. You can see comparing it. Um, Here's, here's Orion, here's the horse head, here's the complex that we're talking about, here's the three belt stars. Um, I could actually zoom in, this is a big image. There we go. Um, there's the belt stars, Alnitak, Alni, Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka. You can see where one of my frames was out of focus there. Um, but yeah, there's the belt, there's the horse, or horse, here's the region we were doing. So this is kind of where my image is there we go so that's basically that whole region in monochrome hydrogen alpha uh, but if you look just a little bit further there's this big arch of hydrogen now if you ever have a chance to get a hold of one of the night vision uh, monoculars you can see this in the middle of town with an h alpha filter it's insane how big it is and it's a very big target um for example, like I said, these are the belt stars right here. One, two, three. I believe this is Rigel or Betelgeuse. I'm not. That's probably Betelgeuse because Rigel's down here. Um, but you can see this big arc of nebulosity. Um, H beta is the way to see this. Some people from dark enough skies have been able to hold up an H beta filter and actually see the arc without any optics, just an H beta filter right in front of your eye. Um, I have not seen that, um, but maybe with a, a pair of binoculars or really wide angle stuff, you could see it. Uh, but night vision is, it's a walk in the park with a night vision scope. 
Um, but it's a very cool structure, but it's humongous how big of the field this actually takes up. Um, but that's how I shot the, the Barnard loop is that big arc. So, um, but the H alpha filter is the trick if you want to do that. So hopefully that helps. So on this one, the loop is like down here, south below the, the frame here. Um, but yeah, so then there's this whole complex, the Orion complex, and here's my zoomed in shot. This is my Orion shot. Um, pretty happy with it. I've been messing with some new processing techniques um, to kind of help adjust for noise and some other stuff. Um, let's see, what what are dark skies? Um, dark skies, I would consider Bortle 4, Bortle 3. Um Usually, if you look at a light pollution map, you start to get into the green regions. Those are half-decent skies. Um, Bortal 3, you're getting pretty good. Bortal 2 is phenomenal. Bortal 1 is very hard to find nowadays, and they're sh slowly shrinking away. So, Bortal 1 is very difficult to find. Bortal 2 is pretty easy to get a hold of, and then Bortal 3 is when you'd be pretty... Bortal 3 is about where you'd be happy. Bortal 4 is... It's acceptable. It's probably worth the night, staying the night at a Bortle 3 or Bortle 4. Bortle 3 is worth a two-hour drive. Bortle 2 and 1s, that's a, worth a considerable drive. Um, this telescope that shot this, our remote observatory at Skies Away Remote, um, is a Bortle 2. So that's where this Orion image uh, was captured. Uh, this is a mix of hydrogen alpha, luminance, and color all thrown in together. Um, took a while to process this thing. Um, it's a few years old at this point, but anyway, you can see there's a ton of detail that's floating out in this region, um, at this point. So, um, but give it a go. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff up in there. Okay. Wow. That we chewed this up pretty quick. Totem, uh, last target of the month. Totem rules. This is an imaging contest only. Um, and you, the rules are, as they are posted here, you have to take a picture of the object that we did for the month. Um, that's how you get the patches. That's that's the rules. Uh, we don't hand them out any other way. So you have to take a picture of the object. It doesn't have to be a great image. It just has to be an image of the object for the month. Um, so you must send this in within the month that the object is posted. You need to email... Um, totem at skywatchusa.com with an image um there's a handful of you that just sent fit files this month a fit file is what we need to confirm that you shot it but it would be better if you also provided a png or a jpeg or even a tiff um but a lot of you just sent fit files and i don't want to sit here and process and stretch your image to showcase it as a jpeg on on the show here um so if you could please send a FIT file or a RAW file plus a JPEG file. Um, so uh, you're saying the belt stars, don't you mean the sword? Uh, well, that field, sorry, going back here, that field that I was showing you guys is huge. Um, the Orion Nebula itself, M42, is in the sword. Um but when we're talking about the stars, here we go. When we're talking about the Barnard loop, these three stars right here where the horse head actually sits, that is the belt right there. The sword's down here, the belt's up here. So it just depends on how wide of a field that you're going to um, work with. Um, these right here are a mosaic of a 16-200 camera with a Canon 200 millimeter lens um, and an H alpha filter. That's how this was shot. This is a humongous field of view, um, tens of degrees wide, nearly the entire constellation. Um, so that's that's something there. And then let's see what else was there. So yeah, that's where that's where we're doing a lot of that. So. All right, so there's the uh, information that we need, name, equipment, image specifications, mailing address. This is the U.S. and Canada only right now. I'm sorry um, when we do need a fit or raw file. Um, so 
that's how we get all your information to ship you your patch and uh, this is the last time you'll be seeing the 2023 patch um next month we are unveiling the 2024 patch um that is coming out and i think we're gonna shake up the totem project a little bit next year um we'll give you more details in january because we haven't quite figured all of that out yet uh but there is going to be a new 2024 patch as usual but we might spice some things up a little bit uh we'll be announcing all of that hopefully in january when we come back um for the to that set up uh now object of the month uh, target of the month for november was this guy right here vdb1 um this is this was challenging but you guys did a really nice job on this there's some really cool uh stuff that actually came out with this so um if you don't see your image in here there was a lot of submissions if you don't see your image it's because i didn't get a png or jpeg file um, to post i got your fit image so you will get a patch but i just don't have an image to showcase here so if you if you if you sent in an image you'll be getting a patch but i might not have showcased your image here so sorry about that but yeah if you could send a fit file or raw depending on how your telescope and camera work plus a png or a jpeg that way we have a showcase uh image it helps um so some very nice stuff i'm actually pretty proud of you guys on what you did with this stuff everyone's image came out a lot better than i was expecting um i shot this from our remote observatory i've never shot it from a dark sky site um but you guys did a pretty good job in there um and there's some cool stuff so um uh, but yeah i'm there's a lot of shots. This one's cool. I love the diffraction spikes. Do you guys like diffraction spikes? I'd love to know what you guys think. I think we've asked you this before, but we've had a lot of people um, who don't like diffraction spikes and some people who do like diffraction spikes. I like diffraction spikes, but um, I think they add some depth sometimes. Sometimes they're a bit overbearing. I like real diffraction spikes. I don't like the fake ones. But you guys did some really cool stuff there. Um, so thanks for everyone. This one was really impressive with a 14 inch Edge HD, but um, some nice detail in there. But uh, yeah, that was some pretty cool stuff. Thank you all who sent in your images. Uh, we will be getting those patches out very, very soon. Um, sorry for the delay on some of these patches. Uh, we do get all of your emails and then we rake them all up and we put them in the lists um, and go from there. So you will be getting your patches. Some of you will be getting multiple patches just to cover them, but you'll be getting them. All right. So December, 2023, this is the final totem target for 2023. It's not going to be easy and you might not even have heard of it. Um, this is LBN 762, not far from the Pleiades, also known as the drunken dragon nebula. I didn't come up with the name. I just shot it. Um, but it's, it's a molecular cloud, and it's not an easy one to find. Um, and there's not a lot of information to dig up on it that I have found as well. Um, but it's very cool, very ethereal. Um, but it's a cool nebula. Uh, but good luck. I will be curious to see what you can get out of it. There's some pretty cool galaxies in this frame that are in the background. Small, uh, but some pretty cool stuff there. So definitely check it out um but that is the drunken dragon nebula i don't know how they came up with the name it's not what i would have called it but sure so good luck that is your final totem target uh these patches will all go out in january um fyi all right that's pretty much it for the month uh thank you very much for watching if you like what you see here please go ahead and subscribe you can email us at info at skywatchusa.com title it what's up um we're almost to 10,000 subscribers. Help us get there. Um, but that is what is up for the month of December. And that wraps up the what is up for the month for 2023. I hope you guys have enjoyed the Totem Project. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the patches. And we'll be back in January with a whole new brand new patch that I think you guys will think is kind of cool. Um, and maybe some other cool stuff that we'll add uh, to the Totem Project. Uh, but anyway... Uh, head back and we'll talk about that in January. 
Uh, next week, I will be out of town. We have a bunch of sales meetings and end of the year meetings that we're doing. So next week, we're doing a last minute gift ideas and stocking stuffers uh, for the holidays. And this is going to be a pre-recorded episode as I will not be here. Um, but it'll be airing at a, um, 10 a.m. Pacific time, just like normal. Um, and then we have one other episode to wrap the year up. And that's it. Um, so two episodes left. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoy it. We will see you guys next week. Um, again, I am... Oh, my camera died right at the end. There we go. Um, we have two more episodes for the year, but this is the last episode for... Uh, the monthly night skies. So two more episodes um, before before wrapping up the wrapping up the season. So thanks very much. Go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on the video. We appreciate you guys watching. Please have a great weekend. Clear skies, and uh, we will see you guys next week. So see you later. Take care. Have a good one. Stay warm. Bye.